Hey everyone, and welcome to another edition of Drone Life News. My name is Paul, and joining me, as always, the editor in chief of dronelife.com, Miss Miriam McNabb. Miriam, how are you doing? I am doing excellent. I'm almost over my jet lag and uh, feeling good. So jet lag, I know that you were at one of the drone shows in Amsterdam last week. I think you were actually the only person that I know in the industry that was actually over there. What were some takeaways from that particular conference? What did you find interesting or new? Amsterdam Drone Week is actually a fantastic conference to go to if you can get to it. Um, You know, certainly Amsterdam, come on, Amsterdam. But (laughs) but in addition, the Amsterdam Drone Week conference is very interesting because it's held in conjunction with the ASA high level conference on drones. And EASA, of course, is the European Aviation Safety Agency Association, sorry, and they are the ones responsible for publishing Europe wide in harmony uh, guidelines. And so they are the regulating body for drone regulations and to be able to have the opportunity to kind of meet all of those people from all over Europe, but also to sit in on those discussions and panels is really fascinating. So um, a great show. I covered it. There was a lot, a lot going on. So we were turning out a lot of content. You can check it out on Drone Life, but a lot of uh, urban air mobility stuff, a lot of smart cities, you know, City managers there talking about how to integrate drones into the uh, airspace, uh, U space, which is um, coming up deadline in January of 2023, and of course all of this oriented around um, common guidelines, the SORA guidelines, which really says this is a risk based. Uh, approach for drone regulation. So great stuff. Highly recommend if anybody wants to uh, have an excuse to get over to Europe next year. It's a great conference. Well, that's good to know. And in regards to regulations, that brings us to our first piece of news. It looks like one of the most restrictive drone laws ever written by the state of Texas shocker, uh, is, has actually been repealed in federal court. Now, you know, a lot of students had always asked us about this, Miriam, and we believed it was unenforceable to start because it violated federal regulations. But what's the story here? So um, th- this is a story, you know, we have a great feature writer, Jim McGill, who is a Texas resident and a drone enthusiast. He's been really following this all along. Chapter 423 of the Texas Government Code, which was a very restrictive drone law. It was really kind of based on everybody's fears about drones, you know, that it's impinging on private property, that it's imp- impinging on your privacy. So there were a lot of limitations on your ability to fly over private property to take images if you were anywhere near private property um, and so forth. And and on March 28th, uh, U.S. District Court judge says this is unconstitutional and also just can't be enforced, which I know that you have said before, you know, this can't be, be enforced. And I think However, having it officially struck down is really important because whether or not it can be enforced and whether they can impose fines or impose limitations they can is different to whether or not you can really be harassed for just working in the area. You know, if if either citizens or police are sort of vaguely aware of the law and they they kind of um, choose to harass people while they're working, that also is very limiting. So the law was challenged by the National Press Photographers Association, Texas Press Association, three Texas photojournalists. So they they were arguing uh, that, you know, using drones to collect images for news gathering is part of your First Amendment rights. And they certainly won on that argument. But along the way, and recommend you both read the rule, which is linked in the article and read the article for the details. Um, you know, there were a lot of other problems with this law. So Hopefully, the fact that the judge was really clear, you know, hey, there's a lot of issues with this <laughs> beyond sort of First Amendment rights um, will prevent other states from trying to do something similar. 
It's also interesting considering that like the highest density of drone pilots uh, per capita is in Frisco, Texas, outside of Dallas. And we know so many ranchers and farmers use drones themselves. So it was kind of like a... It was kind of like a law that didn't make sense because, oh, well, if you use it over here, that's fine. But if you fly it anywhere else, no, that's not OK. Wasn't this related at one point to drones flying over like pig farms for, or for PETA or something like that? I don't know about that um, exactly. But, you know, this is for one thing, this is kind of an old law. And it speaks to sort of the need to really be careful about how you phrase things and how you word things because uh, this, I think, started in 2013 maybe and then was amended in 2017. But, you know, critical infrastructure, you can't fly over critical infrastructure. Well, when somebody's writing that, they're thinking, I don't want you flying over prisons because, you know, there's going to be illegal activity. But they don't think like, hey, water treatment facilities, natural gas infrastructure. We're flying over there all the time. This is a huge, valuable, you know, legitimate commercial application for drones. So that's just not appropriate to use the word critical infrastructure. Actually, as I'm scanning through here, it did say that they did amend it to include animal feeding operations. Not sure hmm, what the, maybe it was something with PETA. But um, certainly to say you can't fly drones over oil and gas drilling sites is not something beneficial for oil and gas companies. Do you feel like this law stood its ground for so long because it predated the FAA creating Part 107 and officially claiming uh, authority over the airspace? Because this law was in, what, 13 or 14? 2013. Uh, um, yeah, I think that it did. And I also think um, that this is another point that I've sort of made uh, frequently. I, I think that lawmakers really need to be very careful about rushing to uh, enact regulations because it takes an awful lot longer to take them down than it does to put them up. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. could not agree more. And in today's day and age where everything is so media driven and, and politicized, there's this rush to create an action which negates research and investigation and making good decisions. And so I couldn't agree with you more that we need more of our lawmakers to be researching what already exists in order to make good uh, yeah. laws moving forward, you know? And we need our entire drone community to remember, like, you know, we all have to really work to educate people because we think we're there. And we're not there. <laughs> you know, we're not there. We need to keep educating. A hundred percent. Speaking of educating, the FAA has had a recent change, as many of you know. On the news show, we discuss Steve Dixon, the current administrator, resigning from his current post many years early. It looks like the FAA has appointed a new acting administrator, and it seems like he even has a safety background. But Miriam, the question really is, is how is he different from Steve, and what do you expect from this? So it's hard to say. I mean, he hasn't had a chance to uh to do anything, right? It's it's uh, April 5th, so he's been um, the appointee for five days now. Um, so interesting, though, that this gentleman, Billy Nolan, uh, Billy Nolan was currently the Associate Administrator for Aviation Safety at the FAA, and now he is stepping into the role as Acting FAA Administrator while the Biden-Harris administration uh, searches for a nominee. And uh, I think the good thing about this is that he was not, well, from the perspective of the drone industry, I guess, um, you know, it doesn't seem like Mr. Nolan has that same kind of coming right out of being a commercial airline executive responsible for stock price. You know, he did have, of course, um, positions in the commercial airline industry, but he held those positions as a safety executive. Uh, so 
kind of a different background, different way of looking at the airspace. Hopefully, Mr. Nolan is open to the idea of drone integration. Uh, we will see how that goes, but um, a different background and we'll we'll see how it works. You know, I do think that as, you know, in the article I wrote, I I hark back to uh, the Commercial Drone Alliance who wrote a letter to the the Biden administration saying, hey, look, when you choose an administrator, please, you know, you need to choose somebody who is forward thinking, who is um, into innovation in the skies and understands all these things and pointed out, you know, hey, a lot of the things that the current administration has um, put forth as goals can really be materially assisted by the use of commercial drones and and you should take that into consideration. So so we'll see what happens. You know, five days in, well, <laughs> it's a little too soon to, to judge, but, um, you know, Mr. Nolan will um, certainly have a, a big job in front of him and uh, we'll see what effect it has for the drone industry. Yeah, it will be interesting. I think the FAA is sending a clear message here to at least the airlines, like you had mentioned, that we're moving away from someone kind of business focused to someone safety focused. And in the wake of that 737-800 uh, crashing a couple weeks ago in China, I think it's becoming even more relevant and even more important. I think, you know, like as you had kind of foreshadowed, uh, that it's going to be critical to have someone who's safety focused, but not so safety focused that they eliminate uh, opportunities for drone pilots as a whole. Since Mr. Nolan is the acting administrator, um, uh, is how long will his tenor actually be? Will it be to 2024? I actually am not sure about that. Um, I think, you know, the acting administrator, the administrator has to be uh, ratified or, or whatever you call it by the Senate. So um, he cannot be the permanent administrator without going through uh, the same process as other candidates. So right now, you know, the Biden-Harris administration is looking for candidates and those will have to go through a review process and then they will have to be uh, appointed by uh, President Biden and then approved by the Senate. So whether Mr. Nolan's name will be in the mix for that or whether this is a, a temporary um, position and he's not interested in being appointed for the five-year term, uh, I don't know. You should also mention that the deputy administrator, Bradley Mims, will also have sort of an expanded uh, role. So he had served at the FAA under the Clinton administration as uh, president and CEO of the Conference of Minority Transportation Officials. Um, but he has been the FAA deputy administrator during the Biden-Harris administration. And so he will also take on an expanded role. Very interesting how uh, two people are taking on the role of one person. It goes to show that that might be a stressful position. Um, I think it is a stressful position. I think there's still, you know, we have the administrator and the deputy administrator, but I think, uh, yeah, boy. <laughs> yeah, boy, indeed. They have a lot on their plate. <laughs> they sure do. They sure do. Well, it'll be interesting to see what stems uh, from this new acting administrator. And Mr. Nolan, the drone industry welcomes you and asks for your help and consideration and to put yourself in our shoes when making objective decisions. Um, that said, uh, as normally, Miriam, you would say, it wouldn't be a Drone Life news show without <laughs> some drone delivery. Well, I've got good news and bad news. Um, good news is it seems like drone delivery is literally taking flight. Uh, in Texas, the bad news is, is that it's coming from Chili's. And you won't be able to get your quesadilla <laughs> burger from Applebee's. But anyway, what's the story here, Miriam? You never know. It could it could be. So really um, interesting stuff. Did Texas, 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 you know, so I, uh, I, I don't know. What's the timing of this? Did the drone law have anything to do with the delivery? Pro Who knows? Who knows? So wing as we all know, did a uh, successful trial in Christianburg, Virginia. They are now engaging in commercial drone delivery operations in Dallas, Fort Worth. It will begin in two days on in April 7th. 
and they are working in partnership with Walgreens. So they will be delivering things from Walgreens, also um, Easy Vet. You can get your prescription medications for your for your dogs by drone delivery uh, or, or your other pets. Uh, with the Texas Health System, they can deliver you a first aid kit to wherever you are when you crash your bicycle. And uh, additionally, I think Bluebell Creameries for ice cream. So... That sounds good too, but they are working in the suburbs uh, of Dallas Fort Worth. At the same time, Flytrex has also engaged in a commercial drone delivery operations. And the reason I keep saying the word commercial is because I think this is really, really interesting. If you think back a few years to the way that those laws evolved, Wing was actually, I believe, the first part 135 carrier that that got licensed by the FAA to be a uh, unmanned aircraft carrier airline or something something like that i forget what it is it's part part 135 which allowed them to engage in commercial drone operations drone operations for profit flytrax achieves the same thing by working with kazi aviation kazi aviation is a private jet and aircraft company um, that also has their one 135 um, has all of those certifications so we are not talking about testing here. We're not talking about an FAA program or a research project or anything like this. We're talking about doing drone deliveries for commercial purposes, just um, straight up uh, business. So that is really a big step forward if you think about it. It is a huge step forward for sure. So Flytrex is the one that has partnered with the Chili's Bar and Grill, I think it is a chain of restaurants. So they have numerous restaurants. I don't, I don't know that we have them all out here in New England. I think we have some of them. But. I think they said there was like included in that was like Maggiano's or something, which I think I've seen before, but I'm not sure that we have one here in tiny old little Albuquerque. So, um, but I have to say, I would much prefer a quesadilla burger from Applebee's over Chili's. Just saying, that's me. Um, but. <laughs> But you can't get it by drone. <laughs> no, no. And with the current rate of success at DoorDash, I, I would prefer the drone delivery. <laughs> so, <laughs> at least in my personal experience, I don't know about all of you out there. Um, but that said, Miriam, thank you very much uh, for joining me today. Thank you for educating all of us on what's going on around the world. And uh, I will say it is very interesting to see this drone delivery taking place right after this federal court shut down a state regulation. So uh, very interesting indeed. Not sure if there's anything there, but uh, it's it's a coincidence to say the least. And who's to say too that because Texas does have a strong uh, drone industry, it really does. So because Texas does have a strong drone industry and Wing wanted to work there and Flytrex wanted to work there and the DFW, um, you know, airspace authorities were okay with that, uh, you know, maybe that helped too, but. I think ultimately it was a poorly written regulation. So, yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, Miriam, thank you again for joining me. Um, as always, do appreciate it. And thank you to everyone out there who listens and supports the show. And thank you to everyone who is also a Drone U member. That's going to do it for us today in this episode of Drone Live News. We'll see you next time.